Hi, I'm Patricia. In this presentation, I will be discussing the first phase of the clinical decision-making process, the evaluation phase. As has been discussed in a previous video, the clinical decision-making process is the process by which therapists analyze client information and formulate and progress therapeutic regimens for their clients. Today, we will be examining the evaluation phase in a little more detail. This phase of the clinical decision-making process is crucial in determining the client's clinical problem and identifying their impairments and functional limitations. The information we gather during this process will help us formulate an effective treatment plan. The evaluation phase can be broken down into three sub-steps. The first step would be to review the reason that the client is coming in for treatment. The second step is to conduct a subjective and objective examination and to generate your initial clinical hypothesis. The third step would be to analyze your findings, which confirms your client's presenting issue. The single most important question that you will ask your client when they come in is what brings you in for a massage today? The answer to this will become the focus of your examination. This is step one in the evaluation process. The second step is a subjective examination. Once you have determined what the client's chief complaints and presenting issues are, you will now proceed with the subjective examination. What's a subjective examination? They are questions to your client to help you gain more information about their health status and the overall integrity of their body systems, such as their respiratory system, their cardiovascular system, etc. At this point, if the client has not come in with a referral or diagnosis, you should already be determining what your clinical hypothesis is based on their answers to your questions. So how do you gear your questioning? If in fact they have come to you with a referral or a diagnosis, you should gear your questioning toward this, seeking answers that will either confirm or refute the diagnosis. If they haven't come to you with a referral or diagnosis, then you should gear your questioning towards eliciting information that will help you clarify your client's chief complaint and suggest a clinical impression or diagnosis. Once you have asked all the relevant questions and have enough information regarding the client's presenting issue, you can more accurately formulate your clinical hypothesis. You should now be able to select the appropriate tests and measures to focus on during the client examination. Now, let's talk about how we will avoid making some mistakes when we're formulating a clinical hypothesis. Firstly, you want to come up with a few theories about the client's problem early on in the exam. You want to have no more than three hypotheses so you can focus your tests and measures. Do not make a general hypothesis as it may fit into inconsistent findings, so you want to be fairly specific. Be sure to include their perception of their clinical condition, functional limitations, and your objective data. Be selective when gathering data and use the referring diagnosis from a doctor or a chiropractor, for example, when necessary. Seek clarification on issues that come up during the exam. What was the main clinical hypothesis? You want to stay focused on the relevant data. Avoid exaggerating your findings to fit into an existing hypothesis. And lastly, be willing to acknowledge that an existing hypothesis is in fact incorrect and seek a new one. Once you've arrived at your initial clinical hypothesis, it's time to perform the objective examination. What's an objective examination? It's a physical exam that is guided by the client history and complaint that consists of observing and performing tests and measures to seek out abnormalities of function. This is carried out in a three-part process. Number one, you want to observe the client. So you want to make a general observation about them. Have a look at their posture, their contours, their muscle bulk. This will help you to obtain information to support your hypothesis or to determine a new one. The second part of the objective examination is to select your tests and measures. Depending on what the client is presenting with, for example, musculoskeletal conditions, neurological conditions, the selection of tests and measures are going to vary according to the presenting complaint. 
the selection of these tests and measures can be tricky. Knowledge of the appropriate examination techniques and their interpretations are crucial at this stage, as it is really easy to become overwhelmed by the numbers of potential tests that can be performed. Having a couple of hypotheses about the client's problem can assist in the choice of these examination techniques. The third part of the objective examination is to actually examine the client. You want to carry out the most common tests first in order to confirm or refute your clinical impression. If these tests are positive, more information can be collected regarding their functional limitations and their impairments. If the tests are in fact negative, the therapist will decide whether they will conduct more tests or change their clinical hypothesis. Once you have performed your objective examination, you'll want to analyze your findings and confirm the client's presenting issue. Do your findings support the clinical hypothesis? If the answer is no, well then you're going to have to formulate a new one. If the client presents with an unclear clinical condition, you'll want to focus on helping the client improve their functional limitations and focus on improving their specific impairments. If your findings do in fact support your clinical hypothesis, you'll want to summarize and document the functional limitations and impairments of your client. This is a key step in helping to formulate an effective treatment plan that will address their functional outcomes. Now that you've determined what your clinical hypothesis is and what issues they are presenting with, ask yourself, will your treatment be appropriate for them? You should take two factors into consideration when determining this. Firstly, your legal right to treat. Does your scope of practice include the treatment techniques for this client's clinical problem? And your ethical right to treat. Do you have sufficient training and competence to treat this client in an appropriate, safe, and effective manner? The answers to these questions should be yes. Once this process is complete, the therapist may now move on to the treatment planning phase. Let's see what you've learned. What are the three basic steps in the evaluation phase? 42-year-old Mrs. Jones has come in to see you for her painful neck. She has not been to see her MD or any other healthcare professional as of yet. How will your line of questioning differ from the case where Mrs. Jones comes in with a diagnosis from her doctor? What is your next step after you ask her all the relevant questions? You perform a few tests on Mrs. Jones, yet you can't seem to reproduce her pain. What do you do now? What other information do you need in order to come up with a proper clinical impression? Arriving at a clinical impression for Mrs. Jones, what are the next few steps you will take to ensure you can help her with her situation? What might be an example of one of her functional limitations? Hopefully now you have a good understanding of the evaluation phase of the clinical decision-making process. Being able to execute this phase skillfully takes practice, but done well will help you to deliver a more effective treatment to your client.